Um, so today we are running a hybrid session. So first of all, a warm welcome to everyone in the room and to everyone who is, joined, uh, who is joining us remotely. So we have about an hour to discuss uh, our topic, the triangle of artificial intelligence, innovation and space. So let me first um, frame our topic. So Germany and the EU are facing turbulences of economic recessionary shocks related to the current crisis in a global context. Building up resilience by responding to changing economic patterns will be crucial. The utilization of AI innovation space will largely determine whether and how we will master the current crisis. Our panel will tackle the questions of how um, uh, the triangle of AI innovation space can provide cutting edge solutions to everyday societal problems to benefit citizens across the globe and to master the crisis. I'm very pleased to have many outstanding experts on this topic. And now let me briefly introduce our panelists. So ladies first, I would like to start with Christina Nikolaus who is the co-CEO and co-founder of Okapi Orbits, a space tech startup that uses AI software to calculate the trajectories of debris in space and to warn space companies of possible collusions. So in a nutshell, reduce the space debris. So welcome, Christina. Then second, I would like to introduce Sabine von der Reken who is a board member of OHB Systems AG. So OHB Systems is involved in some of the key projects of the German European Space Initiative, such as Galileo Navigation Satellites, MTG Metrological Satellites, and EMAP Environmental Satellites. So very warm welcome to you. Then next, I would like to welcome Dr. Andre Heinke, who is a vice president um, at Robert Bosch GmbH and is there responsible for corporate foresight and megatrends. So a very warm welcome to you. Then next is Matthias Wachter, who is the head of department at the BDI and is responsible for international cooperation, security policy, raw material and space. A very warm welcome to you. And last but not least, Lars Zimmermann, who is a co-founder of GovTech Campus Germany, who is the first innovation platform for government technologies co-founded by the federal government, the 16 states and the tech scene. A very warm welcome to you. So first, let me start with a, a general question to every one of you, and I kindly ask you for a sort of short answer. So in the, in the space strategy for Europe and the research and innovation needs of the space program in the period 2021 to 2027, new space research aims to foster a cost-effective, competitive and innovative space industry and research community. So I would basically would like to know from you, from your point of view, what are currently the most pressing issues on space innovation and the use of AI? So maybe just start with Christina. Um, uh, hello, thank you for being here. So in my opinion, the most crucial point is to bring all main actors of the space industry to one table, because what we see in space is that we have extraordinary, extraordinarily high network effects. So we have to bring the polit polit political side, the industry, including startups and established players, as well as the civil, uh, the civil um, organizations and the research side to one table, because with this, with the joint effort, we can uh, enable and foster sustainable innovation and also use, uh, use our resources, which are limited in a very efficient way. Thanks a lot. So you are asking for cooperation. So maybe, um, Sabine, what's your opinion on that? Um, cooperation in space uh, between industries, research organizations, but also cooperations between different, um, different states. Uh, international cooperation is always very important. And uh, this is something which is uh, um, one of the extraordinary points of uh, space has been in the last years um, regarding international politics um, 
every time on Earth uh, it's getting a little bit uh, cold here in Berlin <laughs> between the United States and Russia, something like this, but always the cooperation for the International Space Station um, was like a, like a holy point in space. So this is at least very important. And I think that um, if we cooperate together, then we can also make, uh, make good points um, regarding the the, uh, the demands of the society in Europe and all over the world for, uh, for good space programs and good space mm. applications. Yeah, thanks a lot. So maybe adding with, a, with another opinion more from the industry side, Matthias, what's, what's your opinion on that? First of all, thank you very much for uh, having me today. It's a great honor and pleasure. Um, I'm very optimistic um, when it comes to space. Um, I believe there are very uh, positive developments uh, uh, here in Germany and uh, in Europe as a whole. Uh, we see that um, a lot of new and young companies uh, are coming up, coming online, uh, which have great ideas and uh, great um, uh, applications and solutions of how to make society and also business uh, more sustainable, mm -hmm. more green and more digital. So I think new space the, uh, the current development, um, it's something positive in general. But on the other side, we also see an increased, let's say, superpower competition kind of thing coming back in space. Uh, Russia, a couple of days ago, shot down one of their own satellites, generating a lot of uh, space debris. And uh, I think we need an international understanding um, that um, all countries which are able and uh, are active in space somehow work together and take care of each other and uh, uh, think uh, of, uh, of how can we for the long term preserve space as a common human uh, good and that everyone has, has access to it. And um, so I think um, we really need an, an, an understanding on the international uh, level uh, when it comes to space debris and, and other aspects. Um, and, and what I fear a little bit is the increased militarization of mm. space, uh, what we are seeing. Um, so, but yeah, at a whole, I think space and new space is uh, part of the solution, but there are also some, some, some drawbacks, and I think we need to work on that. Mm. So thanks a lot. Um, Lars, because you're, you're basically working on the intersection between like the, the tech scene and, and, and government. So what's your opinion on that? I think, talking about the tech scene, I think the tech scene is completely sold on, <laughs> on space. So they all want to do it. I think we experience a lot of money flowing into the system, private money, by the mm. way. So, and that's, I think, the first point I want to make that we, again, like in many other areas, see the fact that non-government money is flowing into the sector and they... They, they try to drive stuff very, very deeply. So um, we have that case, we all know this, that the billionaires, the US billionaires, they really take the space topic to move into new uh, you know, fronts of what they call um, innovation. And I think it's right. But I think a second point that we underestimate, especially in Germany, is um, when Amazon, when the people and when Elon Musk um, in Germany felt like that they would do some private competition about who's, who's the first in space. We experience here a debate within the society that this is something that's focusing on the complete wrong issues. We have so many issues on the world to be solved, so why are they spending billions to just go to space for fun? I don't believe that is right. I think going to space is something that will drive a lot of innovation in a lot of areas. But I think you underestimate that when talking about the interaction that the overall political context right now doesn't see or acknowledge space as a mm -hmm. strategic innovation topic. So when you go back into economic history in Germany, you see the most important innovation area that Germany became very good at, like the automotive industry, was an industry where the, the demand side, the people really pushed innovation. So they just used cars, Germans were crazy about cars, so there was a strong demand to make the cars better and better and better. And I think you need to have a domestic demanding demand side to push innovation. I don't see this in Germany, unfortunately, so far. What do I mean by that? I think we need to create a political debate also from the top level that space is not something where we can waste German taxpayers' money. Mm -hmm. It is a very strategic area of innovation, and I think that is uh, something that we have to address much better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks a lot. 
So, Andre, you are you're basically covering everything more from a sort of meta trend perspective. So, what's your opinion on this whole topic? Thank you, Helmut. Um, we have to understand that there will be no European sovereignty without being innovative in space, being present in space. Innovation has always been connected with dreaming about uh, space exploration, about a presence. The Sputnik shock has triggered a huge wave of innovation in the United States. Um, the latest Chinese hypersonics uh, test um, was connected to, to space as well and has triggered another shock, um, a shock hopefully that will be creative in positive ways. Um, the priority should be to ensure that uh, innovation made in Germany is being used for peaceful purposes, for understanding, for building bridges in space as well. But there will be no automated driving without having a presence in space. We have to understand that there is a race about standardization uh, of space components. We have a very successful company uh, uh, being represented by you, where other American companies have become interested, not because they are not innovative, but because they are building on the R&D capabilities that we have here in Germany and in um, Europe. Last point, uh, we have to understand that uh, many new technologies will be connected heavily to space and uh, we have to understand that we cannot stand in between a Chinese space technology and an American space technology. We have to ensure our own capabilities and yet we have to be compatible to the others. And this is a very difficult game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks a lot for all these great introductory remarks. So what I would like to do is uh, dig a bit deeper into specific areas, what we have already discussed. And I would like to start with Matthias um, and basically address the question of which trends and developments are worrying you and which of them you regard as positive. Again, like, like I said in my, my introduction, I, I think the increased superpower competition in space, especially between the US and China, but also uh, with, with Russia, is something increasingly worrying. We see an increased militarization of space. Uh, the uh, asset uh, weapon used by the Russians a couple of days ago to shut down a satellite, um, that's something worrying. Uh, but again, on the other side, the, the overall development, what's going on in space, I think it's something really positive. And um, uh, it was already mentioned here at the panel that space is really an enabler for new technologies on Earth. For example, autonomous driving, Industry 4.0, IoT, smart farming. This is all only possible with space-based applications and data. Um, it's, um, it's already worth mentioning that um, we are talking a lot about these billionaires and uh, the space tourism, etc. But that's really a, a very, very small part of the overall space economy. At the moment, we have a global space economy, economy of roughly, let's say, $400 billion. And $300 billions are space-based data and, and, and satellites who generate and transfer data. So it's uh, really space is at the end of the day, it's about data. And um, uh, space tourism is, I think it's less uh, than 2% of this, this overall market. And it will stay at that, let's say, percentage number because uh, um, the, the, the data business is growing much faster than, uh, than the S aspects. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm very positive. I think new space is part of the solution, especially when we talk about climate change. And um, we, um, 
uh, we need to set a framework uh, that um, that allows young companies and established companies in space to thrive. And I think Europe somehow needs to catch up a little bit. Uh, and a lot of the developments in the US I regard as very favorable. So I think we should look what's working in the US and try to uh, to, to bring it uh, to, to Europe as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so probably leaving uh, space tourism aside, for all of this, we need a lot of money. Um, and I would like to ask a question to Christina. Um, so what does resilience mean in the context of EU space research funding, the provision of services and the required infrastructure for development and explorations of new technologies? Um, yeah, so in my opinion, we first have to recognize how diverse the space industry and innovations from space are. This is the first point. And we also have to understand innovation as a supply chain, because it is one person innovating something. It's all supply chain and a big, pro long process uh, to bring innovation to the markets. And I think uh, all the funding schemes, if we're talking about stable funding schemes, programs, they have to be addressed to the certain development stage and innovation is in. So to give an example, if we're looking, for example, to fundamental research, we think how can we uh, secure that people traveling to Mars have enough food on board? These are innovations in a really early stage, having totally different constraints than a startup like us or OHB in a really late stage. Um, so here we need uh, first have to make sure what is our strategy and where do we want to be in 15, 20, 25 years? Where do we want to be the market leader? And once we see where, where we want to go, we have to uh, back this strategy with a big amount of money and say this must be easy, accessible to a wide range of researchers uh, who can really um, develop fundamental research, uh, which comes to innovation, which is going to be uh, uh, applicable into the industry in the future. And here we can't come with uh, requirements looking at a return on invest. We have to see where we want to go and take risks to, um, to fund this. If we go to another stage where we see, okay, we have startups, we maybe have higher technology readiness levels, we have to, don't have to push any program and say, okay, we just give you money, please continue doing what you do. We have to um, be laser focused on commercialization and see where is the business impact, where is the application field. And I think here, what, especially for space, would be super interesting if the government acts as an anchor customer and see, okay, we have a demand, we want to be uh, uh, sovereign in the, in the whole ecosystem. And, well, we need innovation for that. That we change our mindset, especially on the governmental side and the, the agencies uh, and the big players to open up for innovation and to foster this. And I think, uh, this is my strong belief, that once we have the first traction, uh, once we have the early adopters, we will have a spill in and a wide range of the whole uh, society, basically. And with this, make innovation sustainable mm -hmm. and long lasting. And with this, we will benefit all. Mm -hmm. So having heard uh, more the opinion from a, from a smaller um, uh, space tech startup, I would like to ask you, Sabine, as, as someone who is representing a really uh, large firm in, in that field. So the EU space research funding aims to help uh, to sustain a competitive space industry, including numerous manufacturers, service providers and operators. How do you evaluate the progress so far and how does your company contribute to these processes? So um, EU or ESA research fundings um, have been working very, very good, very well for, um, I think, startups, um, SMEs, uh, large system integrators. Um, this is a very, it's a, it's a good system and um, I think that um, especially the European Commission um, fostering their ideas for dedicated programs um, regarding um, benefits for society like Galileo and Copernicus. Um, it's a very good path to go and to, to go forward on um, establishing space applications, space industry, space branch as, uh, as an enabler for, for the growth of society and especially also for, for Europe's sovereignty. On the other hand, I think that um, seeing that 
especially in the U in the US and especially there with the with the billionaires or with really private money seeing what what their um, next steps are i think that uh, europe has to be a little bit better prepared also in the research funding mm -hmm. um, for example um, elon musk is going to send people to mars He's, since he has he has uh, all his big steps that he wanted to do, and everyone said he's not going to do that. He has done. So I'm quite sure he will do. So, he will do so. And I'm not sure if Europe and maybe also Germany and the new government is aware of what that means, um, also for sustainable space matters about what what, what does uh, people they are not sent from an agency. Um, how do they live on Mars? What's, uh, what's a sustainable way to, to go back from, from Mars to Earth and saying we, we take all our, our debris with us? And I think that there is a very, very big um, opportunity, but also there, there has to be more Europe in, um, also in regulations and the question of how can we foster European research activities to not always being on the second on the second place, not always seeing, okay, someone else is, is going there and we want to follow, but what can we do to be again on the first place? Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, this is something that Europe has to be a little bit more breitschuldrich. <laughs> So a, a, a great call for more European and German engagement yes. in the sector. So what I would like to do now is uh, turning to Lars. Um, and, and basically address the question of the digitalization of administration or e-government involves the simplification of workflows, processes of information and the transaction within and between institutions. Um, so is innovation being sufficiently fostered in Germany and is there room for improvement? So um, the question is slightly differently phrased to more German and European initiative in space. So what's here down on Earth? So I could make it very brief. Okay, yes, there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, but, um, well, there's always room for improvement, of course. And I think of what we underestimate in Germany a little bit in this whole debate about becoming more innovative is that um, the institutions and the institutional settings and the organization is much more important than money. I think money is never an issue. I mean, that does sound a little bit strange, but I think when you do some, when you want to do something great, you will always get money for it, right? So I think the problem really is within the institutional settings. And that is also why I doubt a little bit that reaching out to the European level right now would be the best way to do it. I say this Really, I'm a strong fan of the European Union, so I don't want to make the impression that I speak against it. But I don't believe right now that Germany or the European Union will be able to speed up in a way in space when they try to do it by themselves. I think um, that the game of space will be more a game of competition and not of pure competition. My advice would be just reaching out much more to the United States. I think the space area is a perfect area where Europe, especially Germany and the United States, and via Germany, the European Union, uh, the, the uh, European Union and the United States could do much more better things together. Why? Because I think the German government, and I don't make a political case here, but the German structure of government right now, and also the institutional structure of the European Union they are not really capable right now to orchestrate the ecosystem that you need to become successful in space. Um, in the 60s, the game, the space game, was a 100% government game. Mm -hmm. um, the Russians against the United States, Europe and Germany were completely out of it. I think when we talk about tech areas like space, ecosystems are more important. So um, we need companies in Germany that are capable of doing it. Um, we need um, institutional settings that um, enable the companies to do what they want. They need to have money, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you can't say the German government will become a space tech player, or UK, or the, you know France. Um, I think you need to find the best ecosystem between companies, institutions, regulations, the legal system. Um, the money and the research behind it. And I think that is more like 
government-private partnership-based ecosystems than governments or um, uh, uh, companies? Are we prepared from a pure institutional setting to be capable in organizing these very efficiently? I'd say, unfortunately, no, but I'm per se an optimistic person. I say we have every opportunity, I think, right now. Um, but I think we shouldn't do it by our, ourselves and just focus on the European level. Um, I think we should really, um, you know, get at the side of the United States in this um, and try to find out, to figure out, is there a way of co-petition between Europe and the United States to explore the opportunities in space much better? We have great companies. Um, I think the space tech ecosystem in Germany and Europe is pretty, pretty well. Uh, I think the United States knows that because the investors uh, who now come to Europe and want to invest in a European space tech, they 90% comes from the United States. So, which unfortunately is always the case in every tech vertical, right? The best investors never come from Europe itself. They just come from other parts of the world. So what I want to say is follow the money. That's unfortunately a very stupid, simple question or sentence, but it's true. So if I track the investments right now, uh, many, many investments come from the United States to Europe and we should make use that money kind of flow um, to build an ecosystem between Germany, Europe and the United States. If I, if I may briefly add on that, I, I, I fully ag uh, agree with what, what Lars just said. Um, I, I think in general we need a, um, a different approach of how we uh, address these issues and how we, let's say, do space. Uh, at the moment, everyone recognizes it, it is a huge is issue. There are huge potentials. So the debate is going. We need, um, let's say, we need to put more uh, government money into um, uh, development, etc. Yeah. Uh, on the other side, the US, they are not doing that. What they do is they are giving, and uh, Christina mentioned that before, they are giving contracts to companies who compete with each other. 80% of the contracts Elon Musk and SpaceX has and gets are from NASA, from the US government, from NSA, the US Space Force, etc. So what they are doing, uh, they are handing out uh, contracts, they are working together with private companies, and they, they, they not put the money in a way into, let's say, research as we do. We very often think if we just increase the research budgets, uh, everything will be good. But at the end, what happens here in Germany is we, we do a lot of research, uh, we have great developments, but we don't monetize it at the end, and we don't have products which are, let's say, competitive uh, on the European or international level. So I really think we need to change our system a little bit, look how the US is doing it very successfully, and give more contracts, and even if it's very small contracts, to innovative companies uh, in, the, in the space sector. And I think this will really uh, boost innovation and will help the companies to develop products which are successful at the market. Yeah, thanks for this additional remark. I would, add, I would like to, to ask Andre a question that is basically adding to this ecosystem and, and fully follow the money narr narrative. So from your perspective, what are sort of the general and major trends of innovation um, and in which areas is the factor for resilience remarkably high or low? In general, uh, you are only taken seriously if you bring something to the game. Uh, if you want to become a client state, you are just one customer and you stand in line and you depend on political ties or on money flows. Um, with all due respect to our American partners, and Aspen stands for the transatlantic relationship, uh, GPS, to take one practical example of navigation, uh, has been in the past been restricted or not, depending on the security situation, which is not always clear to us. Uh, and I mean German companies, German uh, authorities. Um, national security thinking and using national security as a purpose for economic gains and, and alliances has been an increasing trend 
in the past few years. We will only be taken seriously in Washington and in, in San Francisco and in the Valley if we bring something to the game uh, and where we have options um, to probably fall back on in case um, the Trump administration comes back in 2024 um, and probably it will be a take it or leave it approach as we have experienced in 5G. Mm. We do not want to be in a position to be strong armed for domestic American political reasons which we cannot influence. This we can only do if we are united in Europe with our French friends who have a great experience in space as well. Um, if we keep our lines open to all the innovative companies that have probably Russian roots, Chinese engineers, but are based in the Silicon Valley or in Israel or wherever. Um, the, the general trend has been to um, be independent in a sense, but data is, and, and was mentioned uh, many times by, by, by you, is increasingly the, the, uh, the trend that is connected to space, to navigation, to communications and so on. Um, developing a joint standard with the United States on data exchanges, that would be a practical first step in using their technology and using our technology in probably uh, bringing up Gaia X uh, um, in, in a certain sense and building trust starting from there. That has been a trend that is quite reliable. Mm -hmm. Maybe just uh, emphasizing a bit more on this narrative that we had for more European initiative and and probably you know more investment from from European or German governments into the sector. So maybe to you, Sabine, where are the sort of great examples of initiatives or companies um, that we have seen in Europe on that? Investing in space. Yeah. So basically, government initiatives, grants, money into sort of best class examples that are basically European based. There are very little, I assume, <laughs> maybe others that might help. So I think the, the, the narrative is we are always arguing for obviously cooperation, Europe, the US, but also with a strong emphasis on Europe Europe's independence or Europe's uh, sort of initiatives. And so the question is, is there anything of, of substance that uh, we can bring to the table from a European German perspective? Of course, of course we can. Um, Europe and uh, especially uh, German, Germany is, has extraordinary experience in Earth observation, instruments, satellites, programs, uh, data services, it's really, uh, especially regarding um, applications, um, I, since the US market is not so transparent for us in that case. So we don't really have the total number of satellites being launched in the United States because most of them are for military uses. And um, I think it's uh, quite understandable that uh, the United States Army is not um, sending newsletters out for about uh, their Space, uh, their, their military satellites. But although we don't really know how many satellites uh, are we built in the United States and we don't know um, uh, the whole sp uh, specifications, we know that um, German and European companies uh, are working on a very high level. Uh, we know that from our export activities and knowing that um, especially um, some states in Asia or also in the Middle East, are really asking for European technology in here. So at least uh, also the, the tradition in, in Europe for space companies um, and 
uh, especially the focus on on applications um, on not so much but in the beginning there was also a focus on big research programs but uh, Europe has been very successful in in applications for a growing European society so this is something which we totally can bring to the table um, I think on the other hand you see that um, since um, Europe has been very successful in um, astronautic space. Um, the European service module has, is built, has been built in Bremen by Airbus, but it's from Bremen. And um, this is flying with, with Orion, uh, and it's going to be uh, one of the key elements for the Lunar Gateway. So mm -hmm. there are many, many good uh, examples and projects where Europe has, or Europe and Germany, have been very successful, and there is something that we can bring to the table. But again, this is something that we can bring more from a governmental approach. So this is where agency sits together on the table. And this is, this is already it's, it's, uh, it's very good, it's good working, but um, I think that we have to, to open our mind for more space activities uh, in, in the commercial sector. And this is a little bit complicated because we don't have that big uh, amount of money in Europe as it is in the United States. And since space has always been and will be always also uh, with a very big impact on, on strategic and also governmental and institutional demands, we have to find ways to follow the money and not only to, only to follow it, but to, um, to bring it to Europe. And we have to be innovative and we have to find ways to be attractive for um, US capital. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this remark. And I just saw uh, Lars um, having an additional comment on that. There's a company called Munarik, which is basically a German company. So they're very international, also big in the United States. But um, that's a space tech company that does, I don't understand the technological issues here, but that does um, laser-based uh, comms technology in space. And um, this seems to be a technology that is so important that the German government is considering restricting investments from others into that company. So, but that's um, very typical for Germany. So they say, okay, or they, they don't say, okay, you need 400, 600, 700 million. The German government could say, you get it from us. We give you the money because we see so many investors who want to invest in you, the American government, whatever, others. We say, let's restrict, let's, let's build a law to, you know, restrict investments from others into the company. And that is, I think, that makes very clear what the lack of mindset is here. When I said follow the money, the best, for me, the best sign that a great technology is somewhere, that a company has a great team, that it has a lot of potential, are the investments from private equities, from VCs. Government is not a smart investor. I'm very sorry to say this. I don't know any government in the world that provides smart money. Um, DARPA is a little bit different, but I won't consider that as a, really a government organization because this is the only organization that is left alone completely. And I totally believe you won't be able to build up DARPA again today. So that was a coincidence, the right people at the right time. And the U US can be very, very lucky that they have that kind of organization where only 250 people work uh, with billions of money each year. But why don't we give away the money to companies where a lot of others private investors are in and just tell them, look, if you want to scale and grow, we don't need to make a law to, you know, prohibit others to invest in you. Stay in Europe because we have the money. I mean, the German government, of course, could invest 400 billion in such a company. The German government, maybe another entity. But that is what I mean. So we don't even have to figure out what is a good technology or a great company or not so great. We will also... At any time when you do investment, there will be a lot of failures. Um, you have to write things off. That's how life is, right? Um, but if we just figure out how to build up with our own money, um, four to six to seven companies, I think we will be much better off in the end um, than providing another research program, which is funded by the German Federal Minister of Research. It's nice and it's good, but I think it's money not well spent. Research does need money and they will get it also from corporates, by the way, it's not only the government money. But in the end, the question is, do companies have the money to scale and to expand? And you need to have the ability to invest also in the national interest. Germany doesn't have that kind of um, entity that is capable of doing mm -hmm. it. 
there's now the plan to change it. Um, I wish the best to actually do it. But I think we need to reach out to the world, and that's maybe that's really the last sentence that I want to say. The storytelling of Germany as an industrial nation, as an industry nation, should really be right now going out to the world and say to all the funders, to all the startup people, to all the entrepreneurs, if you need money to scale, if you need 400, 600, 700 million euros maybe, you need to come to Germany. That should be the basic narrative. It's not about 20, 40, 50, 100 million. There's a lot of money right now in the system, so it's not the problem to get 100 million but really going out to Asia, to the United States, to all the parts of the world and say, if you have a very industrial-based, a very hardware-based, software-based kind of thing, Germany has a story about hardware, has a story about this kind of stuff, very research-heavy, come to Germany because here is your organization that can provide you with 500 million euros. It sounds a little bit strange, but I think now is the time because there are so many big, great ideas coming up. And if we're not doing it, um, I'm quite sure the US will do it and they are quite good in doing it together with the private P&E with all the funds, et cetera, et cetera. We don't have the funds, unfortunately. We are not capable in using the money to do this. So we have to build it up as a government entity and I think that's the best money we could spend. I think Space Tech needs something like that. Hmm. And that's a little bit faster. That's one of the key <laughs> problems we have. It's always it's taking so much time. Yeah. You have a new research program, then you can apply for a grant, and then someone in the government is checking it and it's coming back with other questions. And two years later, you may may have or may have not starting a program which takes you five years. Yeah. And most of the startups, if they if they don't get the money in the first year, they put away. Th that would be my question before we open up to to the floor, because we have an entrepreneur here and a German-based startup. So, what is your experience with like dealing with the government if you have to or with like external investors into your idea is this something that was positive perception or do you see all this these issues we we are discussing so what's your opinion on that um, yeah so we as a german startup uh, with a long long heritage in space research um, we see that we have a really strong standing uh, especially um, out of Germany. So Middle East is super interested, Asia Pacific, the US, they're looking at our research and see, okay, we invested heavily since the 70s at, in our field as one of the first institutes dealing with the topic of space debris when no one else did. And they see this, that we have an advantage from our research coming. And also the customers see, uh, see this advantage that we're having and that they trust German technology. and. Uh, I didn't believe that before I founded my, my startup that uh, Made in Germany is real a quality seal and people love it and they mm. say, okay, you're independent, uh, we trust your engineers, you have good products. So this is a really big benefit for us, but investments in Europe are super different to investments from external Europe. You have investment process which are longer, uh, you have to fulfill more KPIs, it's more you have to have more uh, yeah, numbers uh, prepared, which is very difficult for a young startups. So we are three years old and sometimes you, uh, we just meet the glass uh, wall where we, have, uh, we don't fulfill requirements basically in some cases. And we see that, uh, uh, that non-European investors are often more, take, more likely to take more risk and they say, okay, we believe in the team, we believe in the technology, you've proven traction. So we're trusting you and uh, want to invest. So this is what we uh, experience as a startup. Um, yeah. Maybe just an additional follow-up question on this. Would you prefer uh, state money or private money as an investor in your startup? I think private money helps you to focus on commercial products, to a commercial product market fit, to really serve a market need. So. In this case, I think private investors play a crucial role and can play a yeah, better role than the governmental money. But uh, governmental money is super important, I think, for research topics, for uh, being with the startup, even if it gets rough and even if the sales cycles and development cycles are longer. But it's hard to get there because, as Sabrina said, you fill a lot of documents, a lot of bureaucracy involved. But once you're there, I think it's a good partner to work on long-term uh, innovations. Mm. 
great insights from everyone. So what I would like to do is open up the questions to the floor. Are there any questions? So be so kind to <laughs> introduce yourself, not Stormy, but please go ahead. <laughs> This is why we choose it for this conference, because I'm so fascinated by it. Um, I do have a couple of questions. The first one is to Christina, because I just want to visualize um, what you're doing or what you're planning to do. Will there be big nets in the, in the space catching the debris, or how is that going to, going to work? Do just, just, I do have a couple of questions to the others um, before you answer. Um, this, the second question is, is um, who actually owns space? I mean, is it something we can divide up? I mean, there's a, a law for the seas, but there really isn't a law for space yet. Um, so who's, who's go going to get a piece of the pie and who decides that? And maybe all of you can explain that a little bit um, to me. And then um, the last question to, to all of you is, like, if you have a vision for 20, 2050, um, how is space going to look like? Um, is it really people on Mars or is it a gazillion of satellites up there or lots of debris flying around or um, how, how is it, how is your picture um, at that time? So who would like to go first? Maybe Christina. Yeah, Christina. Uh, yeah, so coming back to what Okapi Orbits does, so we're not in the field of active debris removal, so we're not cleaning up anything up there, uh, but we monitor what's up there and simulate how objects are going to behave in relation to satellites, to micro launchers. So we say, okay, there are space debris coming to your satellite, you have to maneuver, and this maneuver has to look like X, Y, Z. So this is basically what we are doing and using um, artificial intelligence to fuse these big data streams and to have a precise, holistic overview so it's like flight radar 24 just for orbit. All right, who would like to take the question on who owns space? Basically, nobody <laughs> or all of us. Uh, th there is um, a law um, restricting the militarization of space. That has been something out of a coexistence coming from this mad concept, mutual assured destruction. What we see is uh, when the ABM treaty was canceled by the Bush administration, by the second Bush administration, uh, that was a sign for the Russians and for the Chinese that their second strike capability is being threatened. So this race to dominate the commanding heights in space is on. And every test, the one by Russia that you mentioned, the, pre uh, uh, the, the Chinese one a couple of years ago, I think in 2007, the American capabilities that are there, the hypersonic uh, thing, this all points to a race, to dominate um, space in order to be the, the foremost military power on Earth. Uh, why did the Chinese uh, land uh, a rover on the dark side of the moon? That points to the future, to uh, the time frame that you mentioned, Stormy, 2050, where increasingly rare Earth uh, um, uh, things that you need in order to dominate uh, current and future technologies will not be found on Earth anymore, but will be found on asteroids, on, on the Moon, on other planets. And this is about uh, buying a share into future capabilities. Uh, this might be something that we experienced on Earth in the 16th and 17th century, where um, the spots on the globe included many white spaces. The white spaces today are in space. And the more you develop a technolo technological capability, which was in the past uh, uh, steam or, or, or uh, uh, gunpowder or something, uh, space technology will kind of tell others what are, you are capable of doing in space and dominate uh, uh, value, value chains uh, in the future. This is my view, at least. Therefore, it's important that Europe has, has uh, some skin in the game. 
All right. Any other remark on, on that one? Matthias? Um, concerning who, who owns space, there is an outer space treaty, uh, international one, uh, from the 60s. And um, it says pretty much that uh, all nations, all humans, um, should have a fair and equal access to space. And space is something that belongs to, to, uh, to mankind as a whole and not to one country uh, specifically. Um, so the, the, there is, let's say, a kind of um, common understanding, but I think we need to update that. Because in the um, Outer Space Treaty, for example, there is no mentioning of asteroid mining. So um, the German approach to asteroid mining is, because it's not mentioned in the Outer Space Treaty, it is not allowed, and we don't do it, and we don't want to be involved. The US approach is, it's not mentioned, and therefore it's of course allowed, yeah, because it is not mentioned. Um, and, 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 and I think we need to very quickly update this Outer Space Treaty, because as soon as asteroid mining and other activities starts, and uh, some countries will have their first uh, cake, uh, the, piece, the piece of cake of it, um, it, it will get very, very difficult to, uh, let's say, to, to, to update that anymore. So we need, and that would be my looking at 2050, um, my, my vision or what I would, I would hope for is that we get an update of the Outer Space Treaty, that we have a common understanding when it comes to uh, using space, using the, uh, the LEO, the low Earth orbit, that's uh, where all the satellites at the moment are, so um, that we address uh, space debris, that we address on the international level things like asteroid mining, and, and then I, I think we will have or could have a kind of fair competition in space, and this will drive innovation, new technologies, and I'm 100% sure that uh, uh, we will reach Mars, that we will colonize Mars, that we will have permanent presence on the moon. Uh, I think it will come faster than many believe because the innovation cycles are so fast at the moment. And um, I think if we get, let's say, the, uh, the challenges sorted out, it will be a very exciting future. Yeah, thanks a lot. What I would like to do is because there are some questions coming from virtual participants. Um, one is, and that is probably a question to you, Sabine. So, what does privatization of space and space flight mean for AI? What role does AI play here? That's a good question. <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure if I know that uh, from from A to Z. I think that. Um, Space flight and all the, the whole space branch is uh, since we are um, always a little bit uh, ahead and we are very innovative and we have to develop um, technologies uh, that um, that should be innovative in in five years. Um, we are we have that very close connection to AI. But to be honest, I'm not really sure for, from, from today's perspective, um, flying to space with launchers, and it's really not that important if it's um, uh, with humans or not, um, is more, um, it's a hardware thing uh, dealing with physics. Because once you have to, uh, you have to get the step from Earth, gravity is something that is very important for that. And um, most of the, of the rockets that we know today, um, they are not really I don't know, stupid rockets, but uh, f they are rockets. So I don't think that um, AI has been uh, really a big thing in the development of the actual rockets. But um, since we have to uh, be be aware of AI in everything that we develop, um, this will be of course, uh, be a big part in future developments, but not only for space flight, uh, for rockets uh, going to space, but especially for infrastructure in space. So mm -hmm. satellites and um, especially constellations, um, yes, they have to work with AI in the future. All right. 
Um, there's another question that is, AI is often seen as a useful tool in space exploration, especially when it comes to a task humans are not able to perform. So what are the challenges? What role does AI play in Mars exploration? Anyone prepared for that one? Andre? A short, a short remark on, on exactly that topic. Um, since it takes a while, and you have to um, ensure um, steady oxygen flow, uh, uh, evaluate the overall situation. And um, it takes a long time for communications to reach Earth, to react back and so on. You need uh, AI systems integrated into a Mars spacecraft uh, in order to ensure the survival of those astronauts, cosmonauts, taikonauts, however you call them. Everybody will need them. The Chinese, the Russians, the Americans, the Europeans. And um, another field where AI is being used is to reach 2050, uh, to avoid misunderstandings. Remember that incidents, uh, incident in, in the middle of the 80s where a Russian officer decided that uh, it was not an American attack, but uh, some geese flying over Siberia or over Alaska. In the future, and we are lucky then, you need AI systems telling this is a serious threat um, because the reaction time, hypersonics was mentioned, is becoming shorter and shorter. And a president in the US that turned 79, that will be woken at half past three in the morning uh, before he understands what is the matter, because the chain of command puts through uh, the information to him. You need at least some double check by AI systems that this is not a, a matter of survival. Uh, thanks a lot. So regarding time, we have to come to an end. But before that, I would like to come back to Stormy's great question and, and address this to Lars. So from the vision point of view, so what can we expect like in 50 years time regarding space and utilization of space? I think no one knows. Uh, that's unfortunately the case. So whatever happens, um, if I would say what I would, would like to happen, I think um, the Space topic could become a topic where people, societies say, let's not waste money on space. Just before we spend a billion on space or something, let's just raise rents, for example. So I think that's that's really a question that is under addressed. Um, how open and willing societies are really to move into that very, very far reaching kind of innovation area. I think quick wins are very important, as always. So um, maybe we find ways when it comes to the ecological impact of production, maybe we can bring it in, in, into, into parts of the outer space area um, to prevent ecological impact of some you know, production issues on Earth. Um, I think all the energy issues um, maybe might be not solved by using space tech, but I think it could be better addressed, maybe. Um, and if we would find a way, maybe, you know, collecting kind of sun energy from space and bring it to Earth um, and find a way to, you know, uh, reduce CO2 and all these kind of things, I think that will completely turn around the perception about the impact of space tech and space-based research to mankind. Um, if that is not happening, I think um, space most likely will be a private dominated kind of innovation area. I don't see, or I think the development is completely open, whether it will be government driven, government owned or privately owned. Because when we talk about artificial intelligence, for example, we are not talking about government capabilities here. When it comes to AI, it's only private companies, private organizations who own the AI capabilities. No government is actually better than a private organization. And I think we will experience that in space also. So the game is completely open, whether we will have space as a government regulated area or an area where private organizations do whatever they can do because they can do it. Unfortunately, we have to come to an end. So thanks a lot um, to all your insights and remarks to my panelists. And thanks a lot to everyone participating in the room and uh, virtually.
So thanks a lot.